Good evening. And I'm sorry it's so late in the evening, particularly after that great dinner we had. Uh, but count yourselves lucky. You didn't have to work all day yesterday, and you didn't have to travel all night last night, and you didn't have to be awake all day today. So you guys are all very lucky. My ankles are not. Um, it's a great honor to be in your country. Uh, once again, I first visited Holland way back in 1958. Many of you were not born. Uh, but I was in training in England, and I was in training with a, a great young woman, another student, uh, from Holland. And uh, she invited me to spend a holiday with her family in Krimpenandalek. Some of you may know where it is. It's a beautiful village. And her father was the mayor of Krimpenandalek. And since that time, I have come back again and again. Um, first time as a student. The second time as someone who is campaigning for something that I feel very strongly about, female genital mutilation. A situation that many of you did not know about in the 70s and 80s, because it was not something to be spoken about. And it was the time when we were trying to convince people to just give us a chance to listen to us, to tell you about what it is. And an institution that gave me a podium and a place to speak about was the uh, Institute of Social Sciences in Den Haag. And then I was invited to go to Nijmegen, and uh, Utrecht, and Rotterdam, and Amsterdam, and, but never to Krimpenandelek again. But I'm sure you'll take that message back for me. Um, I then came back as a minister, as a foreign minister of my country, Somaliland, to try and explain to the government of your great country where Somaliland is, who Somaliland are, Somalilanders are, and what Somalilanders mean um, by their separation from their neighbors, Somalia. But we're not here to talk about that today. We're here to talk about healthcare. We're here to talk about surgery. We're here to talk about human rights. We're here to talk about survival. And the picture we have on the screen is the picture of a young baby, a young boy, Harir, who was the first baby born in my hospital. Today, Harir is a 14-year-old young boy who goes to school and who wishes to become a doctor one day. Who knows? Maybe he'll become a surgeon. Who knows? Maybe he'll specialize in something very, 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 very specialized, <laughs> like hand surgery. Who knows? But it's a young man who wants to study who wants to go to school, and who wants to do something positive. Now, many of you will probably say Somaliland. She doesn't know where she comes from. She probably means Somalia. No, I do not mean Somalia. I mean Somaliland, former British Somaliland protectorate. Anybody British here? They should know. Here you are, part of the great British Empire. We held up that, you know, that sky for the British Empire. Our sons fought in the First World War. Our sons fought in the Second World War. Uh, in fact, my, my grandfather and my father were both decorated for services to the crown. Um, it's, Somaliland is that country in the Horn of Africa, a place that's peaceful. We don't have terrorists except one woman. Her name is called me. But I terrorize injustice. I terrorize ignorance. I terrorize ill health. I terrorize what needs to be terrorized. <laughs> Inability or not doing something about something that somebody could have done something about. That's what I terrorize. That's what I, who I terrorize. We also have open doors when it comes to health, when it comes to uh, patient care, we have patients who come from anywhere. I don't care who the patient is, if they have a visa or not, they have a passport or not, 
they have money or not, they have a health condition that we can do something about and we just do it. I've, I, I've had many privileges in this life. I've traveled a lot, as I said. At age 16 and a half, I was in London, I was in England. I won a scholarship and I was studying in some of the best institutions there. That's why I could take holidays in your countries. But I went back to my country and joined the UN and traveled the world. And in 1991, I went back to my country after my country had been in many years of civil war. And um, what I saw in 1991 was something that really, um, I, I, I don't know how to describe it. The British never taught me that expression. Um, I was shocked. The cities of my country were leveled to the ground, were destroyed. 95% of the city of Hargeisa was flattened. There were debris, war debris, overturned tanks, uh, military remains of, of, of a civil war, uh, human remains. There, were no, there was no water. There were no roads. The country was full of landmines. It was a quarter of a million of our people died. A million of our people became refugees, many probably in Holland as well, as they did, uh, as they went, fled to anywhere that could give them shelter. United Kingdom, Canada, uh, Norway, Sweden, wherever any major capital in the world had some Somali refugees and initially Somaliland refugees. And um, a great country that we have as neighbors, Ethiopia, had one million Somaliland refugees, hosted a million of our people, protected them from the bombs, protected them from killings. And uh, we have that great gratitude and friendship and relationship with Ethiopia, not only because they gave refuge to a million of our people, but because we are traditional neighbors, we are friends, we trade with each other, we are the same people. And um, I thank them on behalf of my people for having given, given us that chance. Now what I, I'm sorry about dinner, that you have to see pictures like that, but many of you, all of you are medical people, you know what a corpse looks like, you know what mass graves look like, you know what, it means to pull hum put human beings, innocent civilians and children, into mass graves. And many of those skulls from the mass graves were little children um, who were four or five or six or seven year olds. Now what is the military strategy of putting five and six year old kids into mass graves? I don't know. It shouldn't happen. That's a hospital. Who bombs hospitals? Who bombs schools? Who bombs homes? Who bombs civilians? Now that shock, initial shock, wears off and you think, now what can I do about this? Two things. I can run away. I can become a refugee somewhere. I can just hide, not think, not feel, not care, and let somebody else deal with it. And all the privileges that I've had over the years, the advantages and the education and, 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 and all the opportunities I, I had in the years would have been wasted if I turned my back. This is a time when you just cannot turn your back, when people have suffered um, to the level that our people had suffered. And you think, but what can I do? I'm only a midwife. What can I do? And the answer was, do what you've always wanted to do. You always wanted to build a hospital since I, I was 11 years old. So I just decided that, well, this is what I will do. I will build a hospital that will take care of women and children. That at least I know how to do. I'm passionate about it. And that's what I'll do. Um, but then it's a major undertaking. I'm, I'm at that time, 55 years old, in a few years I have to resign. I will reach that magic age 
when the UN will say you're too old to do anything, retire, redundant, permanent parking lot. But then it was a time when I had my career, I had reached the summit of my career. I was WHO representative. I was as high in a position as I could reach in the United Nations. I had a big fat pension coming. I had savings. I had put the things that I had put aside over the years, things that I never used, but I had accumulated over the years, jewelry, trinkets, beautiful things. And I thought, I'm, I never used my jewels. I spent so much time insuring them, so much time putting them in a safety box, so many energy remembering the combination of the safe. And they are such a bother. So, I just recycled my whole life. Everything I had, and every time I see a beautiful Mercedes, I say, oh my God, I used to have one of those. But boy, oh boy, as much as I love a Mercedes, I have so much more that I have been able to buy with that Mercedes. I have so many bedpans, I have so many catheters, I have so many dressings. So, it's not a total loss. Um, so I had to recycle myself, my behavior, my, my life. Try and get those designer clothes out of my system. Try and get those designer bags. Not going to a boutique and say, oh, I love that Chanel one. No, 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 forget it. Give me the Gucci designer things. I love them at the time. I'm happy today. I, I wear this. I think this is probably from, from Bangladesh or somewhere. Five pounds in London. I wear it. If it gets spoiled, it, it doesn't break my heart. But I love it. It's close on my back. I enjoy it. Five dollars, I can afford. And I have to remember that one, once I had social positions, my husband was the prime minister, we were received by heads of states, by heads of governments, we were hosted, we were welcomed. Um, 21 gun salutes, guard of honor. I think many of you remember President Johnson and Lady Bird, um, Dean Rusk. This is in the West Lawn of the White House as guests of the President of the United States. This is the balls, the banquets, the designer clothes. Um, this is, anybody know who this is? Chancellor Kissinger of West Germany. Um, there was Prime Minister Harold Wilson. There was Fanfani in Italy. There was uh, President Charles de Gaulle, le général Charles de Gaulle. Qu'est-ce qui parle français ici? Oui, ben voilà. Um, a life that was so, so beautiful, and, uh, but then that was then. So to do, build my hospital, I had to get my family off my back. Because if, my, my father's house was destroyed because, because of the war. And if I built the hospital before rebuilding our family home, my family would be, every time something, you know, somebody wanted to uh, sort of uh, cut me down to size, they would say, yeah, you built a hospital, but look at your father's house. Look at the ruins. That was a great house once, and look at you. You don't care. You have no respect for your family. So I had to build my family home first. And also, if I built my family home after I built the hospital, people will probably say, oh, she's making so much money of this hospital who's supposed to be a charity. Look at the houses she builds. So, and in any case, if I had built the hospital before I built dad's house, I would not have had any money left because the hospital consumes everything you have. Your pocket, your heart, your soul, your time, your energy. So. First, I got a family off my back, got the land, and started building, and building, and building, and building. Four years on a site that was once a garbage dump. Dr. Asrat operated there. Dr. Thomas Rassen operated there. Fixed so many fistula, obstetrical fistula. Dr. Ras Dr. Um, Asrat fixed so many cleft lips, and so many surgeons. Right now, today, the 14th, 
teams have arrived to do our surgical camps, uh, burn contractures, club foot, um, spina bifida, hyperspadia, anything that comes through the door, every six weeks we have this rotation. And hopefully we will have, we will have COSEXA come and do some teaching with us, for us, and the hospital was born. 2002, and that's where that little boy you saw was born. It's my home, I live there. I live wherever everybody else lives. The only concession is I have a bigger window to the right. I have a bigger window, I love windows. So I have a, a window that is bigger than everybody else's. But then if you want a big window, put in a million dollars like I did. I'll give you a, better, I'll give you a big window too. Um, and this in the middle is my office. Some people refer to it as my observation tower. <laughs> that's that's the, my home, my office, classrooms, guest rooms upstairs, some in the back, operating theaters, delivery, reception, and the, the walls are downstairs and also to the sides. That's that hospital on the garbage dump We've delivered over 15,000 babies, and this is up to September. So you add another 150, 160 a month that we deliver. We've done over uh, close to 2,000 C-sections. We've performed thousands of other operations, cleft foot, cleft lips, fistula, I don't know, anything that needs doing and we could do, we have done. We've treated over 16,000 patients in the, out, in the outpatients. We've treated, uh, in, uh, no, 16,000 in the medical wards, because even though that hospital I had intention, I had built in, with the intention of it becoming a maternity, it's a, a general hospital. Because we do not have the luxury of saying, this is a hospital specialized only to do that. It's a hospital, you break an arm, it's your hospital. You get a snake bite, it's your hospital. You're delivering, you're obstructing labor, this is your hospital. It's a hospital. Whatever we can do, we do for men, for women, for children, whoever gets in, if we can, we do it. Um, and then it also gives me a chance to do not only vaccinations and treatments, but also to fight causes that are very important to me. Again, like female genital mutilation, a situation that should never be done to anybody, which is so much more damaging um, to women. Um, it shouldn't happen. It, it, it has no place in Islam. It has no place in medicine. It has no place at all. But then the biggest gift is not the walls, it's not the bricks, it's not the bedpans, it's not the syringes. The gift I wish to leave behind is the gift of knowledge. The gift of knowledge to carry forward my dream, my passion, to continue to care for our people in their time of greatest need. My future for my country is in the hands and in the, and in the, in the minds of people like Dr. Shukri. It is Dr. Shukri they call at two o'clock in the morning to do a cesarean section. Shukri is here. It's her colleague, Dr. Naima, who is being called now to be on call and as well as take care of the surgical camp for the next week, day and night. Don't teach them time. A doctor needs to do what needs to be done whenever it needs to be done. They are girls and women and young men who have the stamina that really, really make me proud to be associated with them. They have their pride to their nation, they're a comfort to their patient, and in, for me, they are my insurance for the future. I hope I inspire them and I inspire others, like the Dr. Shukris and the Dr. Naimas of this world, because they are the future of our people. Um, but then, I'm a crazy woman, crazy to build a hospital at age 60. And at age 75, I opened a university. Crazy enough, it has to be done. 
I wish somebody else had done it. I wish somebody else had put together a university that has standards, because then I would not have had to do it. But we need to do that. We need to teach. We need to set standards. We need discipline. We need ethics. We need professionalism. That's why I love your country. I love, I love the Dutch. You're methodical. You're punctual. You're, you're, you like to do things correctly. I admire that. And that's what I want our people to learn from you. The ethics and, and, and that, that continuity of perf care in a perfect way. Um, we, we train public health, we train nurses and midwives. We also have medical interns who come from other universities on rotation with us. And they are the ones I really wish to have training for because they are the future, as I said. They will be sent to a little village where they will be everything that that community has. So if they're not taught to fix a fracture, if they're not taught to get a baby out, if they're not taught to get a bullet out of some place, who, who else will? Um, and then, I'm also a realist. You can give me the best surgeons in the world, but that best surgeon will not function if that surgeon does not have a team around him. If you don't have the midwives to screen and to work with you, you will not be able to save those women. And my challenge and my promise to myself is that Somaliland needs 1,000 midwives. And Africa needs one million midwives. I know I will not see that, but I hope many of you will carry that cause forward to make sure that more midwives are trained for developing countries, particularly countries like mine who have nothing else. I do not wish to undermine doctors, but doctors take years to train, 10 years, eight years, nine years, and a doctor cannot function anywhere else but in a hospital with an operating theater, with an ultrasound, with an x-ray, and a laboratory. Midwives are a quick fix. Midwives are a good screen. Midwives are the ones who are close to the community. Midwives agree to work on top of that mountain. Midwives agree to work in an isolated village. And they are the ones who will identify those patients who need to be referred to a second level place for better care. Midwives are the investment. And again, I don't think that the Dutch need to be proud only of their tulips. You have the best midwives in the world. I know because I worked with many of them. You have good midwives and we wish to learn from you. And we wish you to share your expertise with us. Now, what do midwives do? In my settings, they have helped to reduce maternal mortality to a quarter of what the national average is. From 1,600 maternal mortality, we have 441 maternal mortality in my hospital. Out of 15,000 women we've delivered, we've lost 52 women. And if in life, if you can say, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, you must also have the courage to say, I've lost that, I've lost that, I've lost that, and also ask yourself, why have I lost those women? What could I have done about it? How could I have saved those mothers and learned from it? And sadly, you discover that out of the 52, 53 women we have lost, 40% died of eclampsia. Now, who dies of eclampsia in this day and age? The good old sphygmo has been there for years. It's that woman who has no prenatal care. It's that woman who's had no midwife to screen her and say, uh-uh, your blood pressure is rising. We'd better do something about it. Your face is puffy. Uh-uh, your ankles are puffy. Your ring is too tight. Your nose and your upper lips are swollen. Something's happening. Let's check your protein and your urine. Let's refer you to somebody else. Because otherwise, without that midwife, the grandmother will say, oh, you look so beautiful, you've put on weight. You know, you really look good. You know, pregnancy agrees with you. And then that woman is brought to you fitting. 
having been in, a, in having had eclamptic fits for two, three, four, and sometimes five days. And the question is, how is this woman still alive if she, if she has been fitting for five days? You don't want to see that, ever. What's the insurance in the future? As I said, train. And train. And keep on training. And why? For all the good reasons I've given you, but also because they're cost effective. Training a midwife in Somaliland costs me $7 a day. I don't think I could buy a cup of coffee and a, cu a cappuccino in one of your coffee shops for $7 a day. <coughs> Midwives are cost effective. A doctor would have cost me 10 times as much. They are willing to work wherever we send them. They're willing to assist you. They're willing to assist the community. And I like things, sometimes I like to put things in perspective and compare things. In my little mind, if you tell me so-and-so is a giant and so-and-so is a midget, I like to see what the difference is and what it means. Uh, you are seeing 2,000 doctors there. I'm told each tank costs between five to nine million dollars. There are tanks all over the place left by the war in my country. A tank to run needs to be maintained, has to be mechanically functioning, it has to be oiled and greased, it has to be fueled with ammunition, it needs to have officers trained to look after this, to, to, to be able to aim and shoot and kill and destroy and, and whatever. The chains have to be, uh, I don't know, it takes an equal amount of money to keep a tank running, an amount equal to the amount you spend to buy it. And when governments buy tanks, they don't buy one or two, they buy a fleet of tanks. They put entire countries into debt. They buy 12 and 14 and 16, and they train officers and send them abroad to get trained on how to maintain those tanks. They spend money to buy ammunition the, the latest radars, the latest I don't know what else. The only time these tanks come out is on National Day parades or when those young officers who were trained to maintain them stage a coup d'etat and take over from the president who put the country in debt buying those tanks. My appeal is give me, whenever you buy tanks, I don't know, somehow you, the world seems to have a need for buying tanks. I can understand it, why? But give me the cost of one tank or two tanks. That would cover the health needs of that country. And any president who buys, who spends $20 million on the health care of that country will never be ousted. So my appeal is a tank for health. Imagine how many operating theaters we could build, how many sterilizers we could buy, how many instruments we could buy with nine million dollars or two uh, or twice the cost of a tank. To me, this is a better investment. To me, that's what I want to invest in. And we do not discriminate against boys and men because we are partners in our fight against disease against ill health. The hospital has achieved many things, but what I need to show you is what it has achieved surgically. Because we're here to talk about essential surgery, whether it was yesterday at the Lancet Commission in Dubai or today, and hopefully the, the, the tomorrows. Surgery is essential. We cannot have proper health services without adequate and available and accessible and affordable and efficient safe surgery, safe anesthesia. 
anesthesia and surgery that do not result in the death of a patient or in the infection of the wound, that the, a, a surgery that promotes health and ensures healing and prevents infection and prevents complications. That's the surgery we want. Not surgery that is gonna kill this little child. Yes, he will be crippled for life if we don't do anything. But if the surgery we perform on this child is not safe, we will be killing that child. And we're not in the killing business. But that child will not die. And that child is healing. And this child will not die because he will have a shot. Dr. Shukri, who you saw and we were introduced you to a little while ago, has 153, 58, excuse me, 158 children who have had shunts that she monitors. And many of them she operated on. That Somali girl who went to school in a refugee camp, who was trained on a garbage dump, who is one of the first female doctors in Somaliland, is today not only inserting shunts, but passionate about the care of children with hydrocephalus. She stays up late and stays up nights looking for after these kids. 158 children who have been treated and operated for free. For free. Now, what does surgery entail? It entails the bare minimum. I know that when you are doing a, an operation, you will have an entire theater as big as this, full of equipment and monitors. This is what we have to work with. But they're clean, and they're sterilized, and it's what we need. Yes, we would like to have a few more equipment, but we don't. And we're not gonna hold our breath waiting for the time when we will have the kind of equipment that you have. This is what we have today. And this is what we will use. And this is what we will take care of. And this is what we will make sure continues to be available for the next patient and the next patient and the next patient. And we train our staff in their maintenance, we train our staff to look after them, because that's all we have. And that's doing what you can with what you have. Now the world needs to learn from each other. You have so many good things that we would like to learn from you. We would like you to come and share your experiences with me, with us, with the next generation of young doctors and nurses and midwives and, and surgeons of our, of our continent. And any, any country that needs to learn from you because Africa is not the only poor continent that needs help. There are many parts in Asia that also have the same conditions that we have. We need to learn from each other. Many of you cannot get around your head how you can be doing surgery with such limited amount of, of, of supplies. Let us teach you how we make do. Let us share experiences. Let us join hands. Let us do something about this great injustice that not having surgery available for people is, is. That injustice we must join hands to take care of. We must prove to the world that we are compassionate not only with our people, but with the people of the world, because we are in that big global village. What affects you affects us. And we all have that conscience that burns us and says, have I done what I could have done? And I would like to end my presentation, and I'm happy to answer questions, with the story of that hummingbird. A hummingbird goes and picks nectar from flowers tiny little bird. And there was a forest fire once. There was smoke coming out of a corner of the fire, of, of the forest. 
And the elephants ran away, and the lions ran away, and the tigers ran away, and the cheetahs ran away. And there's a little hummingbird that is flying to the little river, bringing back little drops of water and dropping them on the fire. And she's flying backwards and forwards from the fire to the river and fire to the river and fire. And the lions and the elephants laughed at her and said, come on, hummingbird, what do you think you're doing? Do you think you can put out the fire with a few drops of water you're carrying in your beak? And the hummingbird said, maybe not, but I'm doing my best. Let us all do our best. And thank you very much.